On the 1st of May 1960, American pilot Gary Powers was shot down over the Ural mountain range in the USSR. His subsequent capture by Soviet forces sparked an international incident which reignited tensions in the Cold War. On his mission, Powers was flying the U-2 spy plane, a single-engine high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft that was instrumental in US intelligence gathering in the Cold War. Today on the History Chronicles, we will explore the development and operations of the U-2 and the huge role that this tiny aircraft played in Cold War history. The Second World War had seen the USA caught off guard in the Pearl Harbor attacks in 1941. To avoid a repeat of similar surprise attacks, the US military sought to develop better aerial reconnaissance. In the aftermath of World War II, such reconnaissance now needed to be redirected towards America's new competitor, the Soviet Union. In the 40s, the best intelligence held by the US military over the Russians were photos taken by the German Luftwaffe over the Ural Mountains. It was clear that, to improve the intelligence situation, the US Air Force would need the right equipment to conduct overflights of the Soviet Union. This would enable the Americans to keep better track of any significant military developments taking place behind the Iron Curtain. In the early 1950s, the American Air Force commissioned a team of scientists at the Lincoln Laboratories of MIT to conduct research into aerial reconnaissance. The team was led by Kodak physicist Carl Overhage and scientists from Harvard University, including James Baker and Edward Purcell. With their headquarters on Beacon Hill in Boston, the research had the team of scientists travel to air bases, labs and private companies across the country to develop techniques in aerial photography and camera carrying equipment. One of the unusual proposals that emerged was that of a so-called invisible inflatable balloon, flat in shape and coated with a blue tinted non-reflective coating. In the final report, one of the key recommendations of the Beacon Hill Group was that future aerial reconnaissance in non-friendly airspace would be increasingly necessary in the context of the Cold War. Moreover, such reconnaissance must be conducted only with greatly reduced chances of detection or interception. The dangers of an aircraft being captured or shot down were, from the beginning, clearly laid out. Such clandestine aerial activity would mean flying at an altitude of 70,000 feet, Soviet radar had developed to detect aircraft flying up to an altitude of 65,000 feet by this time. In the early 50s, the closest that any plane could come to such an altitude was the English electric Canberra. Even this, however, clocked out at 48,000 feet. To develop an aircraft with such advanced flying capabilities would be a massive feat of engineering. It wasn't until 1953 that work began in earnest on the recommendations of the Beacon Hill report. Dwight D. Eisenhower had, on becoming president in 1953, expressed his dissatisfaction with the intelligence available to the US government on Soviet activities. Moreover, fears were growing in the US administration about an alleged increase in the number of Soviet bombers. For Eisenhower to gain an accurate grasp of the so-called bomber gap between the US and the USSR, new aerial reconnaissance capabilities would be needed. Numerous small aeronautical companies were put onto the job of developing such an aircraft capable of flying long-range reconnaissance missions that could operate outside of the range of Soviet radar. Despite fierce competition from Bell, Martin and Fairchild, it was the Lockheed Corporation that came out on top. The US Air Force had not even approached Lockheed, but the company had heard about the project and submitted their design in any case. Lockheed's best aeronautical engineer, Clarence Kelly Johnson, developed an aircraft design with long, elegant wings and a short, stumpy fuselage. The initial project removed the plane's landing gear to save space and to lighten the load. The aircraft would take off from a special launch rail and land on its stomach, a jet-propelled glider in all but name. Its range was a huge distance of over 1,500 miles and its max altitude was 73,000 feet. It fit the bill exactly for the Air Force's request. This design, called the CL-282, was dismissed at first by the top echelons of the US Air Force. The absence of wheels or weapons was too radical for some. But the civilian elements of the US government showed more interest. Up until now, the Central Intelligence Agency, created by President Truman in 1947, had relied on the US Air Force for aerial reconnaissance missions, and they had thus favoured human or tech-based intelligence gathering methods as a result. 
1954, it was recommended to the CIA's director, Alan Dulles, that the CL-282 be operated by the CIA. It was proposed to Dulles that overflights would be less likely to trigger a war if they were conducted by a civilian organisation within the government, rather than by the military. With the agreement of President Eisenhower, the CIA were now placed in charge of the project. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is where things get exciting. $22.5 million were sent to Lockheed for the construction of the new aircraft. Indeed, the first batch were delivered on schedule and $3.5 million under budget. Look at that for government efficiency. As the aircraft could not take off out of Lockheed's usual center of operations, Birkbank Airport in California, operations were shifted to an alternative location. This was the airbase that would become known as Area 51. A small airfield out in the remote region of the Nevada desert, the site was acquired by the US Air Force and the CIA for the testing of the new spy plane in 1955. The aircraft itself was now given the code name U-2, U for utility and 2 simply because U-1 and U-3 already existed. Small landing gear were now added alongside a specially designed fuel tank to fit into the crammed fuselage. So little was the room left for the U-2's camera that the camera's developer, American astronomer and optic expert James Baker, said that he'd sell his grandma for six more inches. The U-2's pilot was to wear a large pressure suit with a spherical helmet, looking more like an astronaut than an aviator. With the aircraft reaching such high altitudes, it was also imperative that the pilot obtain enough oxygen not to pass out. At 70,000 feet, the margin for error in flying the U-2 was tiny. A change in speed of only a couple of miles per hour could stall the plane and result in disaster. Even on the ground, the U-2's lightweight design meant that the plane could easily drift across the runway or be knocked off course by crosswinds. Visibility in the cockpit was minimal and poor, Upon landing, the U-2 pilot needed another pilot in a car on the runway to guide him in by radio. Needless to say, U-2 pilots needed to be the very best, and required absolute concentration at all times. Of the many pilots that applied from the US Air Force to join the program, only around 10-15% to were accepted. The U-2 flew for the first time on the 1st of August 1955, out of the airbase in Area 51. Declining relations between the Soviet Union and the USA had made President Eisenhower reluctant to give his permission for a U-2 overflight over Soviet airspace at first. At the Geneva summit in 1955, Eisenhower had asked the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev for an agreement that gave each country access to the other's airspace to photograph military installations. This so-called Open Skies proposal, however, was refused. But the first overflight by the U-2 over Soviet airspace had already occurred. The CIA had made use of existing authorization to fly the U-2 over Eastern Europe, conducting a flight over Soviet-controlled Poland and East Germany. The Central Intelligence Agency had then turned to British intelligence at MI6 to request approval for a flight over the Soviet Union, which was approved by the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. It wasn't until July the 4th, 1955, that Eisenhower approved the first U-2 mission over Soviet airspace. This mission targeted Soviet submarine construction facilities in Leningrad and sought to obtain the numbers of the new Soviet bomber aircraft, nicknamed the Bison. Back in the USSR, however, Soviet radar monitored the first overflight of the U-2 with ease, tracking the aircraft in real time from when it crossed into East German airspace. The Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was enraged, ordering the Soviet ambassador to Washington to launch a protest against such operations. A further overflight of the U-2 took place over Moscow and Kaliningrad. The pictures this time revealed flights of Russian MiGs that had been sent to intercept, harmlessly buzzing below the U-2, unable to shoot it down at its high altitude. While the Russians could not destroy the aircraft though, it was clear that its continued detection was likely to spark an international incident. Eisenhower halted overflights of Soviet territory for now, until a solution had been found that could make the aircraft less detectable. More importantly for Eisenhower, the aerial photos gathered by the U-2 on these first missions revealed that the Soviet Union possessed only a small number of bomber aircraft. Any fears about the so-called bomber gap between the USA and the USSR could be put aside. In response to Eisenhower's temporary ban on flights over the Soviet Union by the U-2, the CIA put together Project Rainbow, 
This research project aimed to reduce the radar cross-section of the U-2 aircraft so that it would be all but invisible to Soviet radar. Eventually, a series of failed attempts in reducing the cross-section were to lead to the development of a new aircraft entirely. This was the A-12 Blackbird, a titanium aircraft that could reach speeds of up to 2,200 miles per hour. The Blackbird was, like the U-2, again based on the designs of Lockheed's Clarence Kelly Johnson. First tested in 1963, this superfast aircraft saw operational activity over Asia, flying reconnaissance missions over North Vietnam in the late 1960s. The U-2 was not out of the picture yet, however. In May 1960, the pilot Francis Gary Powers took off in a U-2 from Peshawar in Pakistan. His mission was to take him to the airspace of the Soviet Union, taking pictures of sites of suspected ICBMs and a plutonium processing centre before landing in Norway. Powers' flight was expected by the Soviets before it had even left the ground. The Russians had been aware of the same U-2 spy plane making its way to Pakistan the previous month. Soviet anti-air defences were ordered to attack the American aircraft by any means necessary, and to ram as a last resort. Soviet MiG fighter jets were scrammed to intercept Powers, but still they could not engage the U-2 at such a high altitude. However, such was not the case for the Soviet ground-to-air missiles that the Soviet Union now possessed. A Soviet anti-aircraft battery in the Urals fired three surface-to-air missiles at the U-2 spy plane. The first one hit, reducing the aircraft to rubble but leaving enough time for Powers to safely bail out. He was quickly captured by the Soviets, neglecting to use the suicide needle with which he'd been equipped. Such an outcome had proved Eisenhower's fears about the U-2 overflights of the Soviet Union to be correct. Advanced American technology and a captured American pilot were now in Russian hands. Four days after the incident, the US space agency NASA issued a press release stating that one of their aircraft had simply gone missing north of Turkey. A U-2 aircraft was even dressed up in NASA colours to provide visual evidence for this claim, that it was an errant weather research aircraft. The Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev allowed this story to stew for a while before releasing the full facts of the incident on the 7th of May. I must tell you a secret, Khrushchev said. When I made my first report, I deliberately did not say that the pilot was alive and well. The Russians knew that they had captured an American military pilot in Gary Powers. Even the wreckage of the U-2 still yielded its advanced technologies intact. Khrushchev's revelation that Powers was alive was further worsened when one of Eisenhower's own staff acknowledged that the captured pilot had been on an intelligence operation. President Eisenhower now had little choice but to face up to the reality of the situation. On the 11th of May, he gave a speech that publicly announced the U-2 program, and his role in it. He accepted responsibility for the U-2 overflights over the Soviet Union. This acknowledgement exploded into a worsening of relations between Eisenhower and Khrushchev. When the pair met at the Four Power Summit in May 1960, discussions surrounding their positions lasted only three hours. Khrushchev rescinded an invitation that he had made to Eisenhower to visit the Soviet Union before the incident. He then left the summit one day after it had begun. According to Eisenhower's personal testimony, it was the U-2 incident that was almost solely responsible for the worsening of Soviet-US relations during his presidency. The incident further damaged US relations with Pakistan, Norway and Japan, all of which housed US airbases and now found themselves in the embarrassing spotlight of having spy aircraft launched from their territory. As for the ill-fated U-2 pilot Gary Powers, the ordeal continued. Powers pleaded guilty to espionage on the 19th of August 1960 and was sentenced to three years imprisonment and seven years hard labour in the Soviet Union. Fortunately, a prisoner swap was arranged in February 1962 with the Soviet intelligence officer Rudolf Abel. After only one year and nine months of his sentence, Powers got out of Soviet territory and back home to his family in the USA in a tense exchange that has since been dramatised in the film The Bridge of Spies. The U-2 incident of 1960 saw dramatic changes in the procedures and protocols surrounding the US gathering of aerial reconnaissance. 1960 saw the end of overflights of the Soviet Union and the evacuation of remaining U-2 pilots from bases in Turkey. The CIA now redirected efforts elsewhere, notably to Cuba following the communist revolution there, and to Asia, 
In 1962, it was a U-2 spy plane that captured the famous photographs of medium-range ballistic missiles in Cuba, prompting the Cuban Missile Crisis. In 1966, the pilot Robert Hickman lost consciousness and inadvertently entered Cuban airspace, potentially violating the agreement that the US had made with Cuba following the heated tensions of the missile crisis in 1962. Hickman was eventually killed as his U-2 ran out of fuel and crashed into a mountainside in Bolivia. In Asia, U-2s gathered reconnaissance for the Indian government of Jawaharlal Nehru in the Sino-Indian War of 1962. Further sorties were flown over Vietnam during the conflict there in the late 1960s and early 70s. It was over North Vietnam that the only U-2 ever to have been lost in combat operations crashed in 1966. A U-2 aircraft flown by Major Leo Stewart suffered mechanical problems and crashed several miles in Viet Cong territory. To prevent the Viet Cong from getting their hands on the advanced equipment, a special forces team was dispatched to destroy the wreckage. The development of satellite technology in the late 1960s and early 70s saw a reduction in the use of the U-2 spy plane for the USA. But, that said, this relic of the Cold War had not gone away just yet. The predictable orbital path of satellites versus the versatility of the U-2 has meant that the aircraft has remained a feature of global reconnaissance up to this day. In 1966, only 15 of the original 55 U-2s were still in operation, but production on the special spy aircraft was restarted in the 1980s. The new model U-2s of the 80s were 40% larger than the original and were modular to carry heavier equipment for a variety of different missions. They continued to be developed after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The U-2s of today can carry almost three times as much and can fly twice as far as their originals in 1955. What's more, the humble spy plane has seen off a challenge from the first generation of unmanned aerial vehicles. The Global Hawk, a high-altitude remotely piloted drone that first appeared in 1998, was scrapped in favour of a revamped U-2 with digital capabilities that brought it in line with the demands of 21st century warfare. The U-2 spy plane in 2023 is fast approaching its 70th birthday. Today, as at its inception, it can be readily detected by radar and lacks the immense speed of its sister aircraft, the now defunct A-12 Blackbird. New stealth-based reconnaissance techniques have developed in recent years, most notably the advent of the high-altitude reconnaissance drone in the form of a microsatellite. Nevertheless, no matter for how long the U-2 continues to be used in the future, what is certain is that this small relic of the Cold War has already made its mark on history. Thank you very much for watching today's episode of the History Chronicles. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Please do like, subscribe, help support the channel and help it to grow. And do support us on Patreon if you can as well. I'll see you next time for some more history.